Verse number, this is in Matthew, if you're turning in the ninth chapter of Matthew. Just look with me at verse number 36, down through verse number 38. Matthew chapter number 9 and verses 36 through 38, it tells us Jesus uh, saw the multitudes, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. And because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. They fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And he said unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few talking about people to help get the harvest in. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that's God, that He will send forth laborers into His harvest. He's talking about raising up either ministers or helps ministers or workers, really, in the kingdom of God. How many of you know the kingdom of God moves forward with workers? <laughs> it doesn't move forward by the angels. It doesn't move forward by... Uh, heaven without somebody down here on earth being anointed by the Holy Ghost, sent forth by the Holy Ghost. Not people that just go, but people that are anointed and sent by God. Hallelujah. We can look through history and see people that, that uh, are, are great examples of this. The Lord raises up laborers and workers. So, um, but I want you to see here when Jesus... Uh, saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion and talked to his disciples about this. In other words, his, his, uh, his he, he had really asked his disciples to enter in with him, if I could say that, enter in with him into prayer about his, uh, what his compassion longed to do for these people. God's a God. He can't just do anything He wants to do just because He wants to do it. Now, that, that just blows some people out. If religious people hear that statement, they think, well, my goodness, I ain't coming back to this church. They don't even believe in the sovereignty of God. Well, do you? You really don't if you think about it. God really, He's the highest uh, authority in the universe. That's, that's what the word sovereign means. It means chief or highest in authority. But that doesn't mean He can just do anything He wants to do. Someone said, well, Jesus could. He, when he was here on the earth, he could just do anything he wanted to do. Remember, Mark chapter number 6, the Bible says Jesus in his own hometown could there, not, not wouldn't, could there do no mighty work. And it tells us why, because of their unbelief. There are a lot of things God wants to do, but he's not able to do because he doesn't have somebody to cooperate with him. That's what the Adam's authority down here on the earth meant. God said, uh, you know, I give you dominion over all the earth, yeah. over all the creation, over yeah. all. I give you dominion, Adam. Yeah. That's why Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Yeah. Heaven will back up earth, but if earth isn't doing anything, yeah. earth isn't yeah. preaching the word, earth isn't praying, earth isn't moving as the Spirit anoints them to move, then, then heaven can't do anything. And that's a short synopsis of the authority of the believer, but I want you to see here that Jesus was basically saying, I want to do this. Pray with, pray, you, come, come pray with me about this. There are a lot of things that God longs to do in the earth, and His compassion and longing towards hurting humanity causes Him to yearn to bring it to pass. But yet, there's a lot of things apparently that won't happen if we don't ask, if we don't pray. God wants every person to be born again, every person to come into the kingdom of God. The Bible said He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's His desire. That's the compassion and love of His heart that He wants to do that, but He can't force anybody to respond to Him. So when Jesus had compassion on these people, He asked His disciples to share in that compassion and here's how he asked them to enter into that flow of compassion he said pray that the Lord of the harvest send forth laborers into his harvest now it's his harvest it's his he's the Lord of the harvest he's the one that's going to send the laborers into the harvest if he it's if his job to do the sending and uh, he's it's his harvest then why doesn't he just send them 
why does he have to have us ask him to send them? If you look through the Bible over and over again, and we've done this, I think, in Bible school, maybe in a couple of church services, we've done it. We've gone through the Bible and looked to where God basically is saying, I want to do something, ask me. Remember the Bible talks about in Zephaniah, for example, ask ye of the Lord, excuse me, Zechariah, 10, what is that, 10-1? Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, so shall the Lord make bright clouds and showers of rain and every man grass in his field. He's saying basically, ask me, when it's time for rain, ask me for rain. Yes. Amen. Well, if it's time and you want to do it, he must want to do it or he wouldn't say, ask me. Why would he say, ask me to do something whenever he doesn't want us, he doesn't want to do it? So he must want to do it. Ask me of the Lord rain, of, uh, ask the Lord rain, time in the latter rain, so shall the Lord. In other words, the Lord will do it if you ask. Yes. And all through the Bible we can see that. That there's things that God wants to do, but he needs someone to ask him. The compassion of his loving heart wants to do some things. For all of us, for this city, for this nation, for the world, for the great outpouring of the Spirit, for the great harvest of the souls of the earth. But He needs us to enter into that uh, heart of compassion, to share in that compassion. And one of the ways we enter into that flow of compassion is by praying. The Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into His harvest. Amen. He longs, His, his big uh, uh, merciful heart does not like to see anyone go to hell or anybody in humanity suffer remember last week I think it was last Sunday we talked about Jesus looked about on with anger on people that the uh, Taylor translation says being grieved for the hardness of their heart because of uh, their indifference to hurting humanity that's the heart of Jesus he, he is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. We've been going to that verse. That's been our key verse. And he's still the same today. When he was on the earth, he was touched. He was moved with compassion. He was, he was merciful because of his longing to, to, to minister to hurting humanity. And he's still the same today. Hebrews 4, 16, which is the verse we've gone, 15, 15 and 16, which is the verses we've gone to uh, for many of uh, these services, says we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are. In other words, he's saying, let us come boldly, therefore, to the throne of grace. He's saying, basically, Jesus is still the same today towards hurting humanity as he was back then whenever, whenever he walked the earth. And he walked up to a funeral and saw that this woman is a, is a widow and her only son di has died and her husband's already gone. And so he raised him from the dead because he had compassion on her. He still touched that way. You could call him an easy touch. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I'll be honest with you. Uh, that's the flow that is going to see the miraculous because that's the flow that Jesus moved in to demonstrate the miraculous when he was here. Amen. So uh, Jesus said one of the ways we can enter into this flow of compassion on uh, hurting humanity and into the flow that enters into the miraculous is our prayer life. And I want to get into this this morning concerning the series we've been doing on compassion, if it's all right with you. Even if it's not, I'm gonna. So we need to enter into the. We need to enter into being touched with what Jesus is touched with. You realize in our humanity, there's a lot more that we would like to do for a lot of people, but our humanity is limited. But yielding to this compassion will move us over into a flow of the Spirit that will unleash the power of God to do things that our humanity cannot do. We can enter into the miraculous <laughs> and bring the need, meet the need of hurting humanity. There's things we've got to do to, to, stay, to keep ourselves in a place where we're moved by that compassion. We'll talk about that as we go. Hopefully, we, I don't know if we'll get to that today. But uh, the point is when, Jesus is, when Jesus suffers, and when I say suffer, I'm talking about today, you know, hurting with how people hurt. That's what I mean by suffering. When Jesus suffers today, being, being longing to do, because really identification, 
Identification means you, uh, you take on what somebody else is experiencing. Jesus came to earth to identify with hurting humanity and came to break yokes. And today, sitting at the right hand of the Father, He's called uh, the high priest who is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And He hurts where people hurt. He hurts where people hurt. He's made the way for them to come out of that, but sometimes they don't know it. And He longs for them to know how to get their help. And He hurts with it. And when you and I are joined and made one with the Lord, the Bible said we are laborers together with God. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. Laborers together with God. One way we labor together with God is we enter into this flow of compassion and where He put what's on Jesus' heart, what He longs to do for somebody because He hurts, hurts where they hurt, He'll put that on our hearts. And he, we can enter into identifying with where they hurt. And that flow of compassion can lead us to do a number of things. It can lead us to give. It can lead us to pray. It can lead us to, it can lead us to share something with them. It can lead us to encourage them. You know, bless them financially. Or There's a lot of different things. You know, we don't always have the ability in the natural, maybe financially, to do everything we wish we could do. But yet, right on the other hand, we can enter into the Spirit and yield to the Holy Ghost if there's longings and groanings and yearnings and travail of the Spirit praying for that person then we can actually bring a supply of the Spirit to meet that need on the scene where something will happen that otherwise would not have happened and their need is met are you out there or are you going home and so we need to enter into the sufferings of Jesus you know what I mean by that term now Enter into the sufferings that Jesus begin to feel like He feels, for Jesus can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Amen. Somehow or another, the compassion of God, the love of God, which is a flow of the love of God. You want to know what we're talking about? We're talking about the love of God. But somehow or another, that compassion must be able to penetrate our being. The love of God is already shed abroad in our hearts, the Bible says. So it's already in there, but it has, to, it has to be able to move us. We need to be people who are moved like Jesus was moved and moved to do something. We, we see here that He was moved to ha have us pray. He, he wanted us to move in that. And we're going to talk about that this morning. But um, dedicated believers can enter into this one way this compassion flow and you really won't get there any other way and that is the fellowship with your father you can't fellowship with God and his big heart and his longing to help people you, you can't sit in his presence and fellowship with him the great God of the universe without his love permeating your whole being amen and flow, has compassion flowing into you. I know it's already shed abroad in your heart, but it needs to get. It needs to be just wash all over us until it moves us past. Well, you know, if they would just do the word. Well, maybe they don't see it. And God's not up there sitting up there saying, you know, well, bless their heart. They don't see it. I guess I'll hit them because they don't see it. You know, people trip over things because they 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 don't realize what they're tripping over. And that's part of spiritual growth is, is coming to the knowledge of what it is that the devil keeps using to trip you up. But a baby doesn't get spanked for, you know, trying to walk and falling down. If you do, I want to talk to you in my office after service. No, you could go, way to go, because he got up and took one step and, and plunked on his little bottom. And you cheer, yay, rah, yay, way to go, Johnny, woohoo! Isn't that right? And that's the way God is. And just because they got up and took one step and fell, He's not going to hit them. He's, he's compassionate because they don't realize, you know, what made them, what tripped them up. Brother Hagin said he was at a church uh, preaching one time, and he said there was a lady that came to the altar and had a great experience with God, got saved, and it was a tremendous experience that, that, that really people talked about for a long time. 
And uh, while well, he was at that church as a guest minister, and a year later, he, maybe it was a couple years later, I don't remember how, how long, he came back and asked about that young girl. How's that young girl doing? Where is, oh, they said she backslid. And, uh, and uh, they kind of were looking down their nose at her for backsliding. And Brother Hagin said, the Lord spoke to him just as clear. He said he jumped whenever the Lord said it to him. And the Lord said to him, yeah, and the church is to blame for it. Brother Hagin said, the church is to blame for it. The Lord said, because that was a new baby born into the family, and they didn't do anything to help her. They just thought, well, if she really got saved, she'll make it. If she really got baptized in the Holy Ghost, now the greater one's in her, she'll make it. Yeah, but she doesn't know how to yield to that. She doesn't. And so they just sort of left her on her own. And the Lord spoke to Brother Hagin and said, see, they didn't treat her like, the, like a family in the church might have a baby. That, that baby needs everything to get started. It needs, it needs to be fed. It needs to be, you know, diaper changed. It, needs every, it has to have everything done for it until it can grow a little bit. Isn't that right? Same thing true with spiritual babies. Go over to Galatians chapter number 3. Paul mentioned it in... Uh, the church to, uh, regarding his uh, prayer to God for the church at Galatia. We find it here in the third chapter of Galatians. Let's notice what he said. I believe I can find it here. Uh, where is it here? No, I'm in the wrong passage. I, uh, where is it? Chapter number 4. He said in verse number, yeah, chapter 4, verse number 19. Galatians 4, 19. Now, this is, uh, he's writing to a church of people born again, right? My little children. They, they can't be as little children because they're not biologically as little children. They can't be as little children if they're not born again. He led them to God, and so they're spiritual children. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Travail in birth again. What does again mean? He had travailed in birth. Now, now, what does he mean, travail? He's talking about prayer. He had travailed in prayer be, uh, to, to bring them into the new birth initially. You understand? When he said travail in birth again, he's talking about I had travailed in birth to, to birth that church there. In other words, his prayer life was a part of getting that church planted. You realize he didn't just go there preaching the Word. He preached the Word and travailed in prayer that, 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 that concerning the move of God to get that Word into them, that they would receive that Word. And then he said after they were born again, he said he had continued to travail in prayer because Christ had not yet been formed in them. What happened? So as a result, if you read the whole book of Galatians, they were going back under the law and wanting to, wanting to say, well, we're going to keep the law so we can be saved and all of that. And he said they weren't spiritually grown up yet to walk by faith without keeping the law. And so he said, I'm travailing until Christ be formed in you. So do you realize whenever people are born again, that's not the end of our prayer life for them? Amen. And so there are things that people go through. We, we deal with this. We probably spend more of our time here at Spirit of Faith Family Church, the prayer group that, that helps us, praying over young ones and spiritual babies that just don't get it yet. Now, I'm not saying that as a slam. I'm just simply saying just like a, a two-year-old doesn't get calculus yet or even algebra yet, or even maybe 2 plus 2 is 4 yet. You know, or anything. Doesn't get it yet. No, that doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that we spank them because they don't get it. But, but what that does mean is we got to stick with them. And stick with them until they do get it. And how one way we stick with them is keep on teaching them. Out of compassion. That's the flow of compassion. Keep on teaching them. And then second of all, have, have a prayer life that prays over them that they get it. Yeah. Ephesians 1, always praying that, that we would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge. You realize whenever we get wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him, the devil, what he used to be able to trip us up with, it doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work anymore. But sometimes people say, well, I don't know why that person backslid, or I don't know why that person did this or did that. Well, uh, they, if they realized what the devil was doing, they wouldn't have done that. But they didn't realize it. 
And that could be on us because we didn't pray enough for them. Now, I'm not saying if you do, if you do don't, don't take no condemnation. I'm not trying, this isn't condemnation. But I'm simply saying maybe we need to look a little deeper into the Bible and, and look past the message of faith, which is a valid Bible message, but look past that until what we can do to help these people. Until they can stand on their own. Which a baby cannot stand on their own. They're going to miss it. They're going to they're gonna fall. They're gonna, they're, they're, the devil's going to lie to them, and they'll take the lie, offense or unforgiveness or something. The devil will say something. I mean, i got to give him give the, the cuss one credit, and that is that he's a persistent cuss. Just keeps on. He's persistent. Keeps on. Anybody in here, the devil's worked on you and worked on you and worked on you? He's persistent. We've seen some that it, it prevailed. It, what his strategy was against them prevailed. Just got a report the other day, someone who, who got out of fellowship with God, got out of fellowship with where God connected them in the body of Christ. And uh, bless their heart, everything that was on them before they got connected, that got off of them when they did get connected. We taught them. We trained them. Now it's all back on them worse. I don't glad, I don't glory I don't rejoice in that I don't I don't say I don't say that to say see I told you so I say, that hurts but they don't see it you realize when people don't see it they think they're right but you can it can be real it can be real to you but not be reality and that's the way this person got gifted. Something they thought was so real. They thought it was reality. I talked to the people that they accused, and it wasn't reality. I checked into it. Every person. I, I checked. Is this what happens? No. No. Is this what happens? No. No. You know, in the mouth of two or three witnesses. I, I don't just take somebody's accusation against members of the church just because they were accused. I don't say, oh, then they're guilty. No, I've, okay, two or three witnesses here. Isn't that fair? That's what the Bible says. No, no, it's not true. Is this true? No, I witnessed it. Is that true? No, I witnessed it. But the devil said it was true. And they believed it. They took it. And the devil deceived them. And now everything that was on them got, came back on them. I don't say that to scare anybody. I don't say that to, I, I'm just, I don't say it to glorify and say, I told you so, or anything like that. I say that because that's hard. Do you realize every now and then that, that, that I, don't, I don't mean to be, I'm not trying to be dramatic this morning. But every now and then the devil comes and he says, you see this one, you see that one, see that one, see that. And I can, th I can think of 75 people sometimes. You think I'm making it up. The devil will come and remind me. And you're a failure because you didn't, couldn't help that one and you couldn't help that one. When we did everything we could, we poured out our heart, taught them, sat, cried with them, sat in the office with them, prayed over them. I mean travailed in some cases. But see, people still have a free will. You can't do it for them. You can make power available to them, but then they have to tap into that and say, yes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my help and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond to the Spirit of God, not the devil. Amen, amen, amen. But see, these are things that ought not, that, that, that ought not just, well, next. I mean, that, that ought not be our heart. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Paul said, I travailed in birth again. What makes a man do something like that? Love for him. What makes him, not, what makes him like that rather than, well, if you got anything, if you really got saved, you know, you'll make it. That's not love. Nobody does that with a natural baby. You know? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody know what I'm talking about? When Matt and Katie had their twins... They didn't say to him, well, you're Warners. I mean, Warners, they, they're tough. They make it. Just, just leave them to their own devices. And No, they need everything. And there's not something wrong with the boys because they needed everything. And there's not something wrong with a spiritual baby that comes in and, and, and gets hurt, gets offended, or the devil lies to them or trips them up or something. There's, that's just called being a baby. They live out of their emotions. They live out of their intellect. They live out of their flesh. Their flesh likes, you know, their flesh likes women or their flesh likes boys. Or It's called being a baby. 
We don't hit them. We, we, we have compassion on them. Hallelujah. Amen. And one of the things that, that compassion will lead us to do is pray. And I don't mean, Lord, bless them. I don't have time, Lord. i got to pray for them, bless them. That doesn't do anything but salve your conscience. And you can tell somebody you prayed and almost half be telling the truth about it. You know what I'm talking about? What about this area of prayer the Spirit of God tried to usher in in the 80s called intercession and supplication? I'm talking about praying under the anointing of the Spirit. Not a little God bless them prayer. That you quote mentally out of the top of your head that, you know, you just sad your conscience that you prayed for. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. Dedicated believers can enter into this area of compassion one way, through the fellowship of the heart of God. It's when you get to this place where compassion is able to break through and move you and I that we'll be able to do the works of Jesus like John said, uh, the Gospel of John in the 14th chapter, the 12th verse, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. The works that he did were born out of compassion. We've looked through that. Have we looked through those scriptures? He was moved with compassion and healed. Moved with compassion and fed him. Moved with compassion and taught him. Moved with compassion and prayed. Moved with compassion. In one case, uh, he talks about, the, he told the parable of the, the uh, prodigal son, that the father was moved with compassion and restored a wayward one back. All of that was out of compassion. Amen. And so they, we're gonna do, if we're going to do the works that he did, which he said we can, then we're going to have to do them in the flow that he did them in. And that was by the supernatural power of God, and that flow is a flow of the compassion of God. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. Let's look in verse number 1. Paul said this, you know, this is... This is the, the, the books of the Bible were not written in chapter and verse. And so Paul didn't stay, stop his point in chapter 13 and then start chapter 14 and write about something else. He didn't write in chapter and verse. He just had given us what is written in the 13th chapter about the love of God. You remember verse 4 through 8, charity, that's the Greek word for love, never fails. Suffers long, is kind, envies not, and so forth and so on. And it's the great resume of love. Then he says in verse 8, Charity never fails, and so forth. Whether there be prophecies or tongues, they'll fail. Uh, and so he said, uh, verse number, uh, let's go down to verse number, uh, well, five, verse 13. Now abides faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is charity or love. Verse 14, chapter, chapter 14, verse 1. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, that, but rather that you may prophesy. Amen. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. Listen to the Phillips translation. Follow then the way of love while you set your heart on the gifts of the Spirit. I in my life have set my heart on the gifts of the Spirit. Okay, this was Spirit of Faith Family Church. I think you are, are also setting your heart on not just teaching, but moves of the Spirit. Word and Spirit, Word and Spirit, Word and Spirit. We're talking about a key here to Word and Spirit. I, the Lord gave me a sermon, well, it's a series, really, 20, 20 years ago. Well, actually, probably 25 years ago, the more I think about it. Way back before we even left healing school, he gave me a sermon, a series of sermons, Means and Manifestations for the Move of the Holy Spirit. Means and Methods, excuse me, for the Manifestation of the Holy Spirit. That's how it is. Means and Methods. And the, he, there, there are different things in the Bible that will, that will be a means whereby the Holy Spirit moves. One of them is this flow right here, the flow of compassion. Another one's desire, spiritual gifts. You know, you can look through the Bible and you can see. But anyway, look at this. The, the, the uh, Phillips translation, did you catch that? Follow then the way of love. That's that flow of compassion. 
the way of love while you set your heart on the gifts of the Spirit. Why do we want the move of the Spirit? So we can put our thumbs on our lapels, you see how God used me? That stinks in the nostrils of God. It is to be a blessing. It is to help people. It is to bring glory to God. It is to, to, bring the, to fulfill the work of the kingdom, to finish the work of God down here. We're not going to do it in our good works or, you know, social work or anything like that. We're going to do it by the move of the Holy Spirit. So he said, this is a key. Do you see how he said that? Follow then the way of love while you set your heart on the gifts of the Spirit. He's connecting the move of the Spirit because these... The, this next chapter, the 14th chapter, talks about the, the move of the Holy Spirit, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And he said, the move of the Holy Spirit is this flow of compassion. This is the flow of compassion. The, the flow of the Spirit is in this flow of compassion. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's connecting the flow of compassion to the move of the Holy Spirit. Is He not? Set then your, while you set your heart on the move of the Spirit, follow then the way of love. In other words, this will lead you, this way of compassion, this, this flow of compassion will take you right into the move of the Spirit. You want to see miracles in Walmart? Flow with what your heart's saying. When compassion starts coming up in your heart, Amen. Somebody said, I don't know how to do it. Everybody understands love. Amen. Just flow with that love. You don't have to preach in King James Elizabethan English. Can't even say it, Elizabethan. You don't have to do all that. Amen. Praise God. Now, in, in, these series, in this series, we talked about His compassion towards us and so forth and so on. Let's get over now into this compassion. And that was the flow of compassion generally we were talking about. Let's talk about the, the flow of compassion through us as workers in the work of God. I thought I had some workers in here in the kingdom of God. I, oh, oh, okay. All right. Amen. Our, our work is not just to attend church. It's to get people to God. Amen. Let's talk about this flow of compassion as through us. We've been talking about it towards us. Aren't you glad it's towards you? But let's talk about it now through us towards others. Because we are laborers together with God. If God's going to get it done, He's going to get through, done through His church. He's the head. Jesus is the head. We are the body. Your head doesn't do anything without your body. Jesus doesn't either. We are His hands. We are His feet. We are His mouth. We speak for Him. We, we minister. We, Jesus didn't say, I'm going to come down there and lay hands on the sick. He said, believers will lay hands on the sick. Amen. And that's part of that flow of compassion. I just get, I get, I get, sometimes I get ready for service. I think, well, I've been on that long enough. Maybe I'll get off of it. And I get, on, I get to preaching again, and it starts welling up big on the inside of me. So what we're seeing is we're laborers together. Let's talk about this compassion through us as workers in the king, kingdom of God, getting people to God. Hallelujah. And His compassion towards others. He's not here now, by the way. I said, He's not here now. Amen. God didn't bring you into the body of Christ just to bless you. He did. That's first of all, he's, He just wants to take care of you. He loves you. He wants to take care of you. But He also has a plan to use you. Amen. And, and uh, we know there's, you know, helps ministry in the local church. We understand that. That's God using us to have a church where people can come, so forth. But how about just every day? Every day. Praise the Lord. Well, let's think about this. Um, there in Matthew 9, verses 36 through 38, you remember we read that, we find that uh, this compassion flow, one of the ways that Jesus said this, this will flow is basically there in that passage. He's saying it will flow in your prayer life. Amen. Amen. Your prayer life and my prayer life is to be more, be, be about more than just our own life. It is to be about the work of God. You and I should be putting 
uh, we, we shouldn't be putting our, the responsibility to pray about our own life, direction for our life, our own needs and receiving our own needs and so forth. We shouldn't be putting that on other people. We should be doing that in our life individually. Especially as we grow. Now, as, as a spiritual baby gets started, you know, we can use our faith for them maybe. But that's just, uh, just like a child growing up. You do things for them. But that's just, God never intended that to be forever and ever. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Oh, yeah. But as we grow, we learn to just do our own believing, do our own receiving, yeah. pray the prayer of faith and so on, and take care of ourselves. But also as we grow, we get interested in somebody else besides ourselves. Yeah. And we get interested in what God wants to do in the earth and how He wants to wrap this thing up. And we get interested in James 5. He's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth until He received the early and latter rain. Amen. And I've longed for many times to, because to, there are so many times I get, in, I get unctioned to, to minister because I know people have needs. And I, I do, I want, God wants to meet people's needs. So I don't want you to misunderstand that. But I long for Spirit of Faith Family Church to grow up. And get to the place where beyond just, I need my rent paid, I need this, I need direction. Just do that on our own. Done enough preaching in all these areas. You can find some sermon somewhere that will give you your answer for your own life. Amen. Tell your neighbor, we're growing up now. Praise God. But um, what we see then is that uh, this flow of compassion... Jesus said, pray that the Lord of the harvest send forth labors into his harvest. There must be a, a lack of labors must hinder this. And a lack of prayer must hinder the laborers being raised up. And the lack of prayer could be attributed to a lack of compassion. It doesn't matter to us if the world goes to hell. Could it be, according to Jesus' statement, could it be that it's not important enough to us? And that's why we don't have yet the great harvest of the souls of the earth. We're busy about my rent, my, my bills, my, my family, my child. And listen, you understand, we preached for years how God wants to take care of all those things. So don't think I'm preaching down on that. I'm just simply saying as we grow up. Anybody in here growing up? We, we, we respond when we get somebody on our heart. When we saw somebody last service, last, last time we saw them, we don't know why. They looked as normal as ever. But just our spirit started stirring. And we wanted, oh, God, what is it? Did we take the time aside to pray for that person? The Bible says in Acts 12 that Herod set his, I'm paraphrasing, set his sights on certain in the church to vex the church. There are certain people in our congregation, in other situations, other, body, every, other parts of the body, that Satan has his crosshairs on them. He wants to take them out. Because of the supply they have to the work of God. I've seen it over and over and over again. In fact, I tell people that come on staff, now you're, you're now a target or they become in leadership. You're now a target. That's why we didn't bring you in as a novice, because you're going to get hit with some things you don't know what's going on. He's trying to knock you out because he's trying to keep the, keep the laborers from being raised up so we can give ourselves to the Word and prayer continually. Am I making any sense this morning? Oh, my goodness. Do you realize how how I haven't even got off page one here yet. <laughs> Praise the Lord. There's a move of the Spirit in this area of flowing in compassion and prayer under the anointing of the Holy Spirit that some really don't know anything about. The Lord told me two years ago now, He said, I want you to begin to train this congregation in the things of the Spirit. And uh, I, 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 I'm doing that, but sometimes it's a bit of a struggle to get utterance for it. Can, can somebody help us? Yes, praying, praying, praying. This, this church, by the, by the prayers of this church, by, the, by the, this body praying, can begin to see new births, bam, 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 and people added to the church 
daily such as should be saved like we have never seen before. It says in Isaiah 66, I don't remember, I think it's verse 12. I'd have to look at my notes. But it says there, as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her, her children. Zion is a reference. There's an Old Testament reference to the Israelites when it says Zion. But the Bible says in Hebrews 12, ye are not come uh, to the mount that might not be touched, like the, 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 where the Ten Commandments were given. But he said, you are come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, to the general assembly of the church. We are the church. Z Zion is the church. So there's an immediate definition for uh, Zion in Isaiah 66. I think it's verse 12. Anybody verify that? Uh, what verse is it? Verse 8, Isaiah 66, 8. As soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Uh, there's, a def there's a meaning, an interpretation for that concerning Israel. There's a, and, and that nation will be born in a day. It was born in a day. But there's an interpretation of that in the body of Christ. Sometimes there's some people that will die and go to hell, not because Jesus didn't make the way for them, but because somebody didn't travail in birth. Now, think about that. I don't want to stand before God and say, you remember that burden that came on you to pray and you didn't yield to it? Now, they're in hell because of that. Or a laborer was knocked out that was needed in the supply of the work of God. Because you didn't make a supply of the Spirit to them where the Holy Ghost could arrest them and say, okay, okay I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Because that supply of the Spirit wasn't available to them because somebody didn't yield to the unction because of the compassion of God. He, wanted to, he, he didn't want them to fall into that trap. Then because they didn't yield, then somebody fell into it and they were, they were knocked out. A pastor told me, uh, a, a good friend of ours, pastor friend of ours, told me about a situation of a, a couple that began to come to their church. Uh, that Really, they had been in church all their lives, but not really ever really taught anything. I went to church for many years and wasn't really taught anything. Anybody identify with me? Yes, sir. <laughs> but they began to come to his church, this pastor friend of ours, and they began to hear the word, and they're like, oh, my goodness, I never knew this was in the Bible, and started growing for the first time in their spiritual life. You know, you can go to church and not grow spiritually. Just hear three points in a poem and stories about Abraham Lincoln and, you know, whatever. <laughs> But they really started understanding the authority of the believer and the importance of their words. One of the things, amongst other things. And uh, this lady, particularly, there was a husband and wife that, that got, came into the church, started growing. But particularly the lady, she really got a hold of the word and particularly about the, uh, the words of our mouth and how important the words of our mouth are. And she began to talk to her husband because her husband had for, for years said, I'll never make it past the, day, the, year, the age of 40. I'll never live past the age. She didn't know why he said that, but he just always said that. Now, you know, there's another story I tell you about that, but this is a different case. I'll never live past the age of 40. Well, she started understanding the importance of words and the authority of our words, and she began to talk to him about that. You know, don't say that. Don't say that. You know, it's important what we say. You know, the Bible says, and she would, you should not to be preachy. You know, how many of you know sometimes you can be preachy and people turn you off? But, but she was trying to help him, and because she realized the seriousness of this situation. And so anyway, she's for a couple of years, she's trying to get him to stop saying that. And, you know, he would say, yeah, I know. And then he'd say it again, you know, kind of one of those deals. Anyway, um, she got one day in, in, a, in a, a real burden to pray. You know what I mean by burden to pray? I don't mean like a burden, like a, a, a yoke of the enemy. I mean a real, well, it's really this, this heart of compassion. And, and she, was, she was yearning over it. She didn't even know what it was. She got into prayer and got to praying in the Spirit and uh, prayed. She, I don't remember all the details of what she knew at the time, but she prayed it through because the pastor said she not only got a hold of the Word and became a, 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 a faith lady, this lady started understanding the move of the Spirit, which is where we're going. The door is open because we're going to move in. The door is open. We're going to move in. The call, the invitation from the spirit realm is upon you as a congregation. Move with me. Let me show my power in eastern Iowa. For the demonstration of the spirit is what will bring everything you desire as a congregation. And the harvest will be reaped. And the heart of the father will be gladdened. 
because you responded to this which you hear this morning in Jesus' name. That's what the Spirit's saying. Amen. You can tell there's a different anointing on this. See, I've been trying to get to this service. <laughs> so uh, this lady, she became a, a, well, I don't know if it's not a good term. We say prayer warrior. We're not fighting the devil, nor are we fighting God. But sometimes whenever the Spirit comes on us to pray, we've got to yield to that. And this lady learned to do that. She learned the things of the Spirit. Are you interested in learning the things of the Spirit? I'm interested in teaching some more things of the Spirit. We, my wife and I, have had great success, most of all of it, privately. Great success in uh, these things of the Spirit, praying. When the heart of the Father uh, comes upon us, that somebody's life be spared, or that somebody not go that direction, or that that they not be, you know, the enemy uses deception, confusion, offense, and spiritual darkness to blind their eyes, to separate them from what God had planned to use them to do. And we have had great success, amen, in, in, in yielding to the Holy Ghost in compassion and the yearnings of the Spirit in line with the will of God and praying things out and people catch themselves say, oh, I see it, I see it. I'm not going to go that direction. I can't say, I can't say I've always succeeded because we haven't. Jesus said, listen to me, in Luke 22, Satan desired to have you, Peter, to sift you like wheat. But he said, I prayed for you. That your faith fail not. That doesn't mean there's, people say, well, sometimes faith fails. You know, you believe God, it doesn't work. That's not what he's talking about. Faith doesn't fail because it's built on the Word. The Word can't fail. He's not talking about faith failing where he's believing for something and didn't get it. He's talking about, if you look it up, I could take more time to show it to you and prove it to you, but he's talking about giving up Peter, giving up his faith and failing to stand. If you look up the Word, it actually means to vacate. The word fail could be translated vacate. He just vacated his faith. He just left. He just quit his faith. I prayed for you, Peter, that your faith fail not, and when you're converted, strengthen your brother. Do you know how many times we've prayed that? The Amplified says, Satan has asked insistently that you, Peter, be given up out of the power and keeping of God. Jesus was making a supply of the Spirit and power to Peter to keep him, and that's the only reason that he is in the book as somebody used in the early days of the church because somebody prayed. John 17, Jesus said, I haven't lost a one of them except the son of perdition that the Bible, that the Scriptures might be fulfilled. I can't say I haven't lost a one of them, but there's many of them that we haven't lost. We've had great success. There's much going on behind the scenes. Can you understand what I'm talking about? In prayer, we're not just preaching the Word and then going home and saying, well, I'm going golfing or I'm going hunting or I'm going this or I'm going shopping, and if they got anything, then they'll just make it, and if they don't make it, well, then they ain't. They ain't not, they, no. We travail. We, we, we yield to this flow of the Spirit. It's not in public because people would not, some people would not understand it. And some things ought not be done in public. You understand? Well, so we've had great success. I'm going to finish that story. But there's things that the Father yearns over people to do for Him. But He needs somebody to ask Him. And somebody that's, that's willing to, remember the Bible said, uh, lay your life down. That doesn't just mean, you know, if somebody wants to kill me for the gospel, then I'll, I'll be a, a mar- martyr. Laying your life down could mean what you wanted to do right then when that unction came. Yes. You had plans, but, oh, i got to go pray. Some, i got to go pray. That's giving up your life. Amen. Listen, when you realize people's lives are on the line, when you realize laborers who this church needs are being targeted by the enemy to strip them away from this congregation, then you'll be serious about when that unction comes. Sometimes you know what you're praying about, sometimes you don't. You can be successful at it without knowing what you're praying about. 
because he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, and he knows what he's having you pray about. He knows. All right, so we've had great success through our union with him and being laborers together with God, not just in teaching and preaching the Word, but in praying. Amen. And yielding to whatever He's touched with and whatever He puts on our hearts to be touched together with Him about. That anointing of the Spirit moves us to pray something out that changes the destiny of somebody's life. Are you out there with you? You hearing me? Because God can't do anything on the earth unless he, somebody asks Him because He gave, gave us that authority down here. Amen. Hallelujah. We've had tremendous results along this line. Do you realize there's many, 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 many stories we'd like to tell, but we can't because we don't want to embarrass people. But just know that there's people here, not because of their faith, but because somebody prayed for them and made a supply of the Spirit. Are you here? My own life. You might say, well, you're bragging on yourself. No, I'm bragging on the Word. And my own life is a testimony to it. You heard Miss Emily Mahaffey tell about how she prayed. Listen, if she hadn't have prayed, I'd be out. I'd be. I'd either have my own, uh, you know, uh, excavating business or your landscaping business, or I'd be farming or something. Yeah. Yeah. But somebody prayed. Yeah. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that He'll send forth laborers into His harvest. Amen. Well, back to that story. I know you're wondering. You thought I forgot. This is a, uh, a story. Remember I told you about this lady got this burden to pray. Her husband kept saying, I won't live past the age of 40 or till the age of 40. I think the way he said it. Uh, but so she got a burden in prayer one day in the spirit and started pouring out her heart and, and, and realized that, if I remember right, she realized she was praying for him. But, you know, uh, she couldn't really tell him everything because he didn't understand the flow of the spirit. He's starting to learn the word, but spiritual things were still a bit indistinct to him. So she never said anything to him. And, and prayed it through until she got a note of victory. And uh, just worship God and thank God for hearing her and, and for the victory. I mean, it was only a few days later she went to church. A few days or within a week later or something, she went to church. And she, he didn't want to go. I think there was some things at the shop he worked at that they were behind on. He wanted to get some things done. And so he went to the body, well, not a body shop, but a maintenance shop, automobile maintenance shop. Then they put those... You ever see him put those cars up on jacks? And he went there to fix something up, and so he'd get ahead for Monday and be ready. So he wasn't at church, but she was at church. And she came home, and he's home. But he's real quiet, wasn't saying anything. How you doing? Good. He didn't want to talk. He didn't even want to look her in the eye. He tried to avoid her. Actually, tried to go in the other room, watch TV. He didn't want to talk. She realized this is, this is strange. He's acting unusual. And she, she just prevailed upon him. Something happened to you. What happened to you? You're acting different. Why don't you want to talk to me? And he said, well, he said, I was, you know, I went to the shop. And he said, I jacked the car up and was working on it, and it slipped and fell off and fell right on top of me. And he said, I'm laying there thinking I'm dying right here in the shop. There isn't anybody here to help me. And he said, all of a sudden, he said something. He said something. I, it was someone. It was, I believe it was an angel. Picked that car. He said, that car pick, was picked up off of me, and I crawled out, and I had no injuries in my body. Listen, the devil was trying to take those words that he had spoken. I'll never make it, because he's right now at 39. I'll never make it to the age of 40. Try to take those words and use them against him to snuff him out. You know, whenever you open the door to the devil, the devil takes advantage of those situations. Sometimes unknowingly, people open the door to the devil. Do you realize unless somebody prays, a lot of those situations, it's called what you say will come to pass. A lot of those things will, will happen exactly like they say. But sometimes there, somebody picks something up in the Spirit and prays, and something is averted that otherwise would have happened. Not because God willed it to happen, but because they set it in motion because spiritual laws are in the earth. 
But God found somebody in this situation, his wife in this situation, that would pick that up in the spirit because God didn't want that man to die at 39. There's a lot of things God doesn't want to happen. Are you, are you hearing the heart of this? A lot of things God doesn't want to happen. People that are that are that their lives are snuffed out prematurely. People that uh, are are to be raised up to be laborers in the work of God that uh, either get deceived or disgruntled or somebody somebody uh, fails morally and so they get away from God because see all Christians are hypocrites or whatever. There's a lot of things that God doesn't want to happen, but unless we pick up this flow of compassion and prayer, they will happen. Are y'all? here in the spirit of this. Well, we need to spend some time on this, talking about this, this area of prayer. This is not the prayer of faith that we're talking about. I have wanted to do a series on prayer, and I don't, I'm, don't, I don't claim this is going to be a series on prayer, but I've been wanting to do a series on prayer, especially prayer of intercession and supplication, for a long time, and I never have gotten unction for it. But there's pretty good unction here this morning about some things. We'll see where this goes. But here's my point. This is a flow of the compassion of God. Somebody said, I don't know how to, I don't know how to yield to this. These, remember Romans 8 says, the Spirit helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Amplified says, uh, well, I don't remember if it's the Amplified, but another translation says, yearnings and longings too deep for utterance. There are, there are expressions that you don't know how to intellectually ask God for. You don't know how to talk to God about it. But, but there will be yearnings and longings of God's heart. He wants to do something that will come up out of your heart. And you'll find yourself groaning and travailing. And in God's mind, that is intellectual. I mean, that, that is understandable is what I'm trying to say. He knows what the yearnings of those, of, of those expressions of your heart mean, and He goes to work on what you're praying about even when your mind doesn't understand what it is. That's why we need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost, filled with the Spirit, and yielded to the Holy Ghost because we can pray out these things. Otherwise, things will never be changed that would have been changed, could have been changed. Amen. But it's all come, it all flows in this flow of compassion. Well, did you get anything out of this? My goodness, I didn't even get... I got ten pages here, nine pages. And I didn't even get part of it. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Somebody said, Pastor, then, then uh, you're, you're the preacher. You should be doing this. You ever read your Bible? The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. He didn't say of the preachers or the pastors, but a righteous man. We have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. That's all of us. So all of us are to be yielding to this flow of compassion and yielding to this flow of prayer. Amen? It's not just up to the ministers. It's not a calling. Well, I'm not an intercessor. It's not a calling to be an intercessor. The Bible says that we, has, we have been made kings and priests unto our God. We are a royal priesthood. The priests uh, had, the, one of the benefits of being a priest in the Old Testament was that you had access to God and you could make sacrifice for others on behalf of others. And in the New Testament, every believer is a royal priest. And we can all go into the presence of God on behalf of others. Amen. And pray things out on behalf of others. Now, there's some situations I've wanted to pray about, but I, but I couldn't get unction to pray about. There are situations I've prayed about for years. Amen. I guess people think they were making it because they're hot stuff. But uh, and, and I got witnesses here. I got witnesses here of how that sometimes I would call them into my office. I'd say, I got, I got an unction to pray. We've got to pray. I said, I don't like to talk about people, but it's this person. Let's pray. And the Holy Ghost would fall, and we would pray until that unction lifts. And we'd see in the Spirit what the enemy was trying to do. And that person's life was spared of that. And I guess they think they made it through because of their faith. But somebody, there's a lot of us that wouldn't have made it. I wouldn't have made it if somebody hadn't have prayed for me. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 
See, there's more than one kind of prayer is what my point is. And so we've got to learn to do this. God tried to move back in the 80s in the area of intercession and supplication. And the enemy uh, perverted it, and it all got off. But that doesn't mean God still, tr still doesn't want to move that way. Can you say amen? amen? In these last days, you hear this? I'm almost done. In these last days, there's laborers that need to be raised up. There's work that needs to be done. There's an outpouring of the Spirit that needs to happen. There's souls that, that need to be reaped, harvest that needs to be reaped. And there's also an enemy going about with great wrath because he knows his time is short. You understand what I'm talking about? As we go forward and as, as time progresses in these last days, it's going to be like the, the, the children of Israel in Egypt. There's going to be great calamities out there. But there's going to be people under the blood and under mercy in here and people under protection because somebody prayed in here. Go to Ezekiel. I'm trying to, I'm trying to quit. I say in here. I'm not talking about only in this church. You understand. I'm talking about under this protection of, of God's mercy and people praying these things out. Uh, Ezekiel 22. I don't know if I can quit right now. I've got to share this before we quit. Ezekiel 22 says this in verse number 30. If you look at the context here, because of sin in Israel, there was judgment falling. You can look at that prior in the previous verses. Then verse 30, he said, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own ways have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord, saith the Lord God. Somebody said God wanted to judge that situation. Obviously, he was trying to avert it. Because he said, I was looking for somebody to, to stand in the gap. That's the definition, by the way, of the word intercession, to stand in the gap between two parties at odds with one another. And, and he said here, judgment fell only because somebody didn't stand in the gap and ask for mercy. Someone said God likes to judge. The Bible said in Micah 2 8, I believe, he said he delights in mercy. And another place in Ezekiel, he said, I don't have any pleasure in the death of the wicked. That's God. He has no pleasure, he said, in the death. He doesn't enjoy it. He doesn't say, well, you got what's coming to you. He doesn't like watching people go to hell. He made the way of escape for them. But sometimes they're all blind and the devil's blind. But see, travail in the Spirit can bring that to a birth in the Spirit. Can bring that person to a, to a hallelujah, to an encounter with the power of God. I don't think we'd have the record of Saul of Tarsus in the Bible if the disciples at Damascus had not been praying because the Bible said they were praying amen and that made the power available and the power fell while Paul was on the road to Damascus and straightened his string out turned him another direction Peter was in jail and in chapter 12 of Acts they gave themselves continually to prayer and what happened an angel came Woo! That was the supply of the Spirit to get those laborers back out working again. And there's a lot of people that are stumbled and fallen, and they need to get up and get with it again. And this kind of prayer is one way to work with God and, and His compassion, His, His mercy towards them. Because to, He's got a call on them that, that the Bible says the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. There's people all over eastern Iowa that God sent here that have a call to be a laborer in this last day, yet they're sitting at home on Sunday morning. I, I don't say that to judge them. I say that to say, let's pray for them. We need them. I said, we need them. We need them. If God said that this is where you belong, which they all came and told us that's what God said, then, then, uh, then we need them. Amen. I am more impressed with God today than I ever have been because He gets so much done with so few people. Think of what He could do if everybody obeyed Him and everybody responded to Him. 
Oh, my goodness. Oh, ah. <laughs> we're going to get it done. Because we're not willing. Listen, the, the, remember the Bible said in Luke 22, Satan, Jesus said to Peter, Satan has desired to have you, Peter, that he might sift you like wheat. There's one problem the devil had. Jesus wanted him to. Jesus said, the devil wanted you, but I want you more. But I want you enough to yield to this flow of prayer. Hallelujah. Do we want these people? Do we want the plan of God? Do we want the harvest? Do we want the outpouring of the Spirit? Satan wants all of that. But we want it more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.